Welcome to Celebrating Act Two. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life. Good morning and welcome back to Celebrating Act Two with our uh, very special guest, John Mariani. And uh, hello to my partner, uh, John Coleman. Good morning. Well, hello to you too, Art. Hey, John, how you doing? Good morning. It is uh, raining here um, in New York State, but it's uh, been a beautiful, beautiful spring. Really? Well, we've just gotten sunshine up the wazoo here in Southern California. So and heat uh, and heat that. and heat and heat. It start with finally the weather has turned. It started to get warm. Yeah. As so, Fred, John, as Fred Allen once said, California is a nice place if you happen to be an orange. <laughs> Well, I'm looking more orange every day, I must say. Um, last time we talked, was it last time? Well, not too long ago. Uh, we asked you for, you know, what's going to happen to the restaurant industry, given the COVID-19 and they're all shut down. And, you know, when's the world going to open up again? All of that kind of discussion. Um, and you said, well, let me, let me research a little bit more. Let me think about it. Uh, don't want to prognosticate too early. So... Have you thought about it? That's the question. What's going to happen to the restaurant industry after COVID-19? Will it survive? Well, the reports are dire from many people. Um, Tom Colicchio said uh, he, uh, well, what is it, Bravo Chef or something, said that he expects 70% of the restaurants never to reopen. Ooh. And report out of California said maybe 25% will not reopen. However, um, although food critics like myself are not paid to be Pollyannas, um, the historian, the culinary historian in me um, is very much a Pollyanna because I know the history of how restaurants have survived uh, in the past under even more restrictive circumstances, like having your whole city destroyed in a bombing in London or Dresden or, or you know. Uh, so what I did was to just go back in history and do the research. And I found that after every pandemic, including the Spanish flu of 1918, which killed upwards of 250,000 French people alone, the restaurants in Paris were still open. Um, and after every disaster that has struck, including 2011 and 2008, uh, the same dire warnings have come down the pike, and yet they reopen. So I'm happy to go back in history and tell you what happened and how it happened and how restaurants, more than any other industry I know, is the most, or the, or the most resilient in the world. Uh, but uh, one question for you, John. Um, uh, Resilient reopening, but are they really going to be reopening or is it just going to be a volume of restaurants replacing them? Will people be going out of business or will they be reopening the same restaurants? Oh, absolutely. Many, many restaurants will go out of business um, because every single week, new restaurants uh, before before Corona, uh, every single week, 10 restaurants would go out of business, the storefronts would be open, and within three months they were replaced by another restaurant, by different owners. Um, that's just the way things work. Uh, people <coughs> in, in, uh, in Asia, which have these outdoor food markets and night stalls and uh, street eating, um, of course those will reopen. There's, there's no question that they will because people not only need to go out to eat, but are very desirous of going out to eat. And uh, it's something people have to be fed, and <clears throat> people have to be fed the same kind of level of food that they expected before. But of course, things are going to change. Um, do we need another 10 restaurants like Per Se, which has cost three, $400 a person uh, and has a 20-course menu? No, I don't think so. Uh, maybe one restaurant like Per Se will uh, survive. But there will be radical changes, as there always have been throughout restaurant history. Well, do you think the chains are going to make it uh, more, uh, the chains are going to come back in full strength versus all the mom and pop? I think around uh, my neighborhood, for instance, uh, we must have five chain restaurants and they're all pretty good. You know, th th we frequent them every once in a while, but there's probably also five mom and pops 
Um, I, of course, they're all Italian now that I think Italian or they're um, Chinese, Asian food. Yeah, Asian. Yeah, yeah uh, but they're mom and pop operations. I, I don't think they're franchise. Well, I know they're not franchises. Um, and I wondered again whether it's the numbers are equal or not. Will the chains have an easier time coming back? I imagine they will than the mom and pops. Oh, absolutely, because they have very deep pockets. We're talking about industries that make billions of dollars a year. Um, now, having said that, many KFCs and McDonald's are, of course, franchises and by individual uh, individual owners, and they pay um, McDonald's for everything from the uh, the, the deal and then very often the um, real estate. Um, and that's one, of, that's one of the smart things that franchise uh, companies did was to buy the real estate and then rent it out. That's where they're making the money <laughs> from from the real estate, not from the hamburgers and the uh, pieces of fried chicken. So the people who are selling the fried chicken and the hamburgers are the small guys, um, although some of them might own six or seven McDonald's around Los Angeles. Um, but yeah, they're going to have a harder time than uh, McDonald's itself, which will own the real estate. And as we know, real estate never goes away. Right. And also, um, uh, even if many of those small McDonald's, uh, for instance, not to pick on them, go out of business, uh, the parent company will just find new franchisees to go in there who, who may have money and a desire to open up uh, uh, a McDonald's. So they'll probably be, I agree, they'll, they'll probably be around uh, without a problem. And the Olive Gardens and the Macaroni Grills and some of those uh, will still be around. But mom and pop, uh, 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 Gino's Pizzeria may not survive, but but uh, Giuseppe may open up uh, his version of the same thing. Mm -hmm. well, we've got uh, one of my favorite local Italian restaurants is Sorrento's, mm -hmm. and I call her Mama Sorrento. I can't think of her first name, but she and her husband started that restaurant 45 years ago. He mm -hmm. died five years ago. She and her sister still run it with you know a small cadre of uh, waiters and waitresses and um i worry that she won't come back because i love that place they've got the best spaghetti sauce i've ever had in my life um but that's that's the kind of restaurant that i think would be sorely missed and you're right it's probably the most vulnerable well as i said uh, many of these will go out of business to have it to return but they will be replaced and and i said let me go back a bit in history there was no such thing as a restaurant before the 19th century. You say, what? They had taverns, and they had roadside taverns, and they had cafes, but there was no such thing as a place where you went in, sat down at your own table, got a menu, ordered a bottle of wine off a list, had a person actually serve you. They didn't exist until after the French Revolution when the aristocrats, cooks, were thrown out of business if they didn't get their heads chopped off and opened up uh, restaurants in Paris. And after the French Revolution, which, as we know, shut down everything um, and, and slaughtered thousands upon thousands of people, um, there was this burgeoning middle class, the bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie wanted to eat and eat out well. And so the former cooks of Louis XVI and Duke Duke so and so, um, when now the people running these uh, uh, brasseries and bistros, and curiously enough, the word bistro is thought to come from when the Russians defeated Napoleon for the second time, and they were flooding into Paris. The Russian word for quick, quick, I meaning I want to eat quick, is bistra, bistra. And they think that's where the word bistro <clears throat> came from. But there were hundreds upon hundreds of bistros in Paris. After the um, after Napoleon uh, uh, left town for the second time, and then later on during the Franco-Prussian War, things were so bad in Paris that people were that butchers were selling cats and dogs. Yet the restaurants stayed open. Now, a lot of people were starving, but those who could afford to, and the very rich people, were going to restaurants that were ser serving camel and lion meat and elephant meat because they. They killed the animals in the zoo just to be able to survive eating. Yet, when the Franco-Prussian War was over in 1871, 1872, bada bing, it all came back. And that was the great golden age of, of restaurants in, in France and Paris. Uh, World War I, as they say, uh, 
something like 10 million, 3 million, I think, 3 million French men died in the trenches. And the pandemic of the, the Spanish flu killed another 250,000 people in, in France. Yet, the Jazz Age was one of the great periods for restaurants in Paris. World War II, it was occupied by the Germans, and the best restaurants, mostly in hotels, were taken over by uh, taken over by the Germans. And the German officers ate exclusively at places like the Ritz and uh, the Creon. And if, if you saw the movie *Inglorious Bastards*, yes, uh, Quentin Tarantino says a chilling scene in which the Nazi commandant is having this glorious meal at a restaurant with the uh, <clears throat> French uh, cinema owner who she he's actually questioning uh, while he's eating while he's ordering more 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 uh, food and having this wonderful schnitzel and so forth and she's sitting there barely able to keep it together it's a very chilling scene but that was very very true of that period now America was never affected we were never bombed but um, during the Great Depression, was a time, if you watch the movies of the period, when everything from diners and, and roadside cafes, as well as very swank supper clubs and, and, and restaurants were uh, open, even during the Depression. And during the war, even though we had rationing of food, and everybody had their ration books and so forth, the major cities like New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, which were ports of entry and leaving for hundreds of thousands of servicemen, they were able to stay open and service those servicemen. And then after the war, when America had its enormous boom, which we call the baby boom and so forth, after the war, that was the golden age of American restaurants. That's when franchises started. That's when McDonald's started. That's when um, uh, theme restaurants began. That's when all the great chains began. And you got some of the greatest French, Italian, Chinese restaurants um, ever. Um, so along comes 9-11, and we got these same dire predictions. Restaurants would never recover in New York, never recover. Well, within a few years, within a year, that was, that was, uh, that was false. After the 2008 recession, said the same thing. And I remember um, a restaurateur saying, landlords don't seem to know that there's a bad, bad recession on, and that we don't have our... Um, our business customers with uh, with expense accounts coming to, and they're not allowed to. There are lists out there that you can't go to this restaurant. You can't spend more than fifty dollars on wine. We're not going to survive. Well, of course they not only survive, but they're doing better than ever. In two thousand, when nine eleven happened, there were twenty thousand restaurants in New York. That was a fairly steady number up until now. Today there are twenty six thousand. Okay. Now, what will happen in the next year? I expect a lot of them will go under. But I also expect uh, a lot will replace them. Look at Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, 2005 in New Orleans. The entire city was either flooded or the Latin Quarter, which was not specifically flooded, was put out of business because of a, a lack of electricity. No tourism. All the cooks and the waiters fled the states, went to Houston to get jobs. And this was pretty much the end of New Orleans as a tourist destination. Well, that didn't prove to be true. And when Katrina struck, there are approximately 1,000 restaurants in New Orleans. Today, there are 1,300. So I feel very, very Pollyanna about the restaurant business. And I do so because <clears throat> you know, the buyers and sellers don't change in the business. You and I, you want to go to Mama Sorrento. I want to go to my favorite restaurants, and I want to, in my profession, I want to try it out, new ones, so I can write about them, both here and in Europe and, and elsewhere in South America and so forth. So there is an enormous appetite for it, and there are always going to be people who will feed that appetite. But the difference, and I think this is significant, the difference between a nice family of Thai people or Chinese people who run a, uh, a dry cleaners or a hair salon or a nail salon. These are small business people who um, have their little storefronts and maybe they expand, maybe they open two or three of them. But very few people go into the dry cleaners business because they love it. They go to make money for their families and put their kids through college. And that's the American way. 
to go into the restaurant business as a small independent operator, you have to love it. And they do. It's a very rough business. Profits are not very high and you get wiped out by what's happening now. But I can't tell you how many uh, restaurateurs beg their children to become doctors, lawyers, and anything else but go into the business. The kids <laughs> go dutifully to law school. They work on Wall Street for two years. They come right back to the business. It's it's really, it's really one of the few businesses that you have to uh, you can adore, and you have to be in it. You can't do anything else. So for all of those reasons. Um, I think it will become uh, it will come back bigger and better than ever and, uh, when everybody figures out what bigger and better and ever the, is supposed to look like. And newer and newer. Yeah. Yeah. In, um, in the diary of Anne Frank, there's a scene when they think they're still going to get out of the attic. I mean, they're just like us at the moment. They're all stuck in an attic up there. And their scourge is the Nazis. If they're discovered, boom, they're all dead, taken to a concentration camp. But they're musing after a few weeks about, well, when we get out of here, what's the first thing you're going to do? And Frank says, boy, I'd love to go to a dance. And the young boy says, I want to see a Western movie. And the um, parents, the old ones and the younger ones, say, ah, do you remember that strudel at that pastry on such and such a street? And the other one says, oh, and that, that beef stew that they used to make at that beautiful restaurant with the lace curtains and the linens and the candles. They weren't, none, none of their desires, when we get out of here, we're going to reform the political system here in the Netherlands and make, it, make sure that Nazis never come back again. No, this is the eternal appetite of people to go out and have a good time. Because when you turn the lights on the street, and restaurants are the ones to do it first, when you turn a light onto the street, it changes everything. It changes everything in rotten neighborhoods where there wasn't any restaurants. You do that in places like, you know, Treme in New Orleans and the Lower East Side and in New York, which used to be drug haven. You turn a restaurant light onto the street and people look and say, oh, look, an Indian restaurant. Oh, look, a little steakhouse. Oh, look, a little French bistro. And one follows the next. And, that, and after that come the dry cleaners and the nail salons and everything else. Wow, what a great perspective. Thank you, Pollyanna. <laughs> Very happy to be a Pollyanna. As I said, we food critics are generally paid to be a little bit snarky, but uh, I'm very, very hopeful. Well, you're uh, anything but snarky. As a matter of fact, for people uh, who just finished watching this in uh, uh, just a, a few minutes, uh, can go to um, uh, johnmariani.com and uh, see articles about restaurants in all its glory um, uh, and some in in glory i guess uh yeah. over the years and uh, follow it there and i'm sure over the next few months we'll be talking about these new uh, spots yes. that open up and become john's uh, favorite uh, uh maybe mama leone oh no that was taken already <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a company that actually still owns the trademark to that, and uh, someday that uh, may reopen. Right. You know, I will John. say about being uh, I, I, as you guys know, um, I have specialized all my uh, career in food writing, writing about restaurants I really like. Now, that doesn't mean I might not complain about the rotten service or about they have a terrible wine list or something. But I have to say that I'm going to be a little bit more careful about that in the future. Um, if I'm writing about a restaurant that I really like, I'm going to take for granted that the bad waiter I had last Tuesday is not like every other waiter in the place on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Because from here on in, until things are really booming, and they will, um, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because I don't want them to lose one I, I want to bring customers to their restaurants. I don't want to dissuade somebody from going there because of a bad waiter or a chipped wine glass. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that's why I love your reviews anyway, because you, uh, you're not, you don't, you're not one of those critics who's out to destroy, you know, there's a certain kind of critic that um, writes is. articles that they think they glorify themselves mm -hmm. by destroying the people they're criticizing and and you're 
criticisms are usually critiques, uh, not just, not mild, but they're accurate and they're fair. And they're supposed to be helpful. They're supposed to actually alert the restaurateur that this is what's going on in your restaurant. You may want to check it out. Yeah. And if you Listen, put we've got all of this is uh, fodder for another video for yep. uh, another report. Uh, and as we were talking, I had two or three ideas. So we've got a lot more to talk about in the future. And we look forward to seeing you again on Celebrating Act Two. Uh, and I do encourage everybody to sign up for your newsletter, The Virtual Gourmet. Uh, excellent read, fun read. Uh, so th with that, say goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, goodbye everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.